The topic of this video is equilibrium constants. Equilibrium, equilibrium constants is essential for understanding chemistry. To be able to determine concentrations at equilibrium, we need to be able to understand equilibrium constants. If you like CSI, you should like equilibrium. Many analytical techniques that they use are based on equilibrium systems. By watching this video, you should be able to write expressions for Q, Q sub C, K, and K sub C for reactions. Please remember Q is a reaction quotient. It changes as the reaction proceeds. K is a constant for a specific reaction at a specific temperature. It shows you the most stable configuration. You should be able to understand the differences between Q and Q sub C and between K and K sub C and understand that when Q equals Q sub C and when K equals K sub C. You should be able to understand when a reaction is multiplied by a number, the new equilibrium constant is equal to the original equilibrium constant raised to that power. You should understand that when the products and reactants of a reaction are switched, the new equilibrium constant is equal to the inverse of the original equilibrium constant. You should understand that when two reactions are added to the equilibrium constant, the new reaction is equal to the product of the original equilibrium constants. And so I really like this graph on the bottom. It shows you free energy plotted as a function of reaction quotient. And so delta G naught is the difference in having pure react products versus having pure reactants. The delta, the, the naught, the super up zero corresponds to standard conditions. Delta G is non-standard conditions. And so delta G can be determined at any point. And delta G is actually the slope of that line. And so you notice that when Q is equal to K, that's equilibrium, that's the most stable configuration. The lower the energy, the more stable. And notice that the slope of the line is zero. And so at equilibrium, delta G actually equals zero. I should also mention that Q and delta G non-standard change as the reaction proceeds. K and delta G naught are constants for a, spe for a specific reaction at a specific temperature. And so in terms of non-standard conditions, to calculate products mass reactants, we have to be able to calculate G non-standard. And so it's going, G non-standard is actually equal to G standard plus RT natural log A, where A is the activity of the compound. Now I probably should have deltas in front of these Gs to know that they're enthalpies, uh, Gibbs free energies of formation relative to the elements in their standard state. And so for the activities in general chemistry, typically what we do is we simplify it a little bit. And so in general chemistry, typically we say that for ideal gas, the activity is equal to the partial pressure over one bar. And dividing by one bar gets rid of the units. For ideal, for a solute, we assume ideal solution. You know, again, for the activity for a gas, we assume ideal gas. We typically in general chemistry, we assume ideal solution. And so the activity becomes the concentration divided by one mole per liter. Again, getting the units away. And so activities are unitless. Also, typically we say that pure solids, pure liquids have activities of one. Now in more advanced courses, like organic, analytical, or physical, you probably will not make these assumptions. But again, in general chemistries, we assume that ideal gas activity is equal to partial pressure, unitless. Ideal salute activity is equal to concentration, unitless. And for pure solid, pure liquid, the activity is equal to one. And so, if we have glucose at 0.25 molar concentration at 25 degrees Celsius, what is the non-standard Gibbs free energy? And so we can use that equation. The standard Gibbs free energy, again, I should have delta um, to note these are even for standards relative to the elements in their standard state. And so the standard Gibbs free energy formation for the glucose is minus 917 kilojoules per mole. And it corresponds to standard conditions, which are 25 degrees Celsius and one mole per liter. And so we can calculate the non-standard by using this equation. And so again, we're going to use, assume ideal solution. So the activity for the glucose is just going to be equal to the concentration divided by one mole per liter, making it unitless. If we're taking the log of something or the natural log of something, it has to be unitless. And so we get the non-standard Gibbs free energy for the glucose at 0.25 molar concentration as being minus 920. And so there is a difference. Now we can calculate delta G non-standard by doing the products minus reactants. It is a state function. And so we can use this equation to, cor to fill in for the Gibbs free energy of the NO2, Gibbs free energy of NO, and Gibbs free energy of O2. And so we're going to plug in the things on the right-hand side of the equal sign into the above equation. Uh, again, remember that if there's no superscript zero, that's non-standard conditions. Superscript zero is standard conditions. And we're talking about A's activities. And so if we plug these equations the right side into the top equation, we get that the change in Gibbs free energy of non-standard conditions is equal to two times standard Gibbs free energy of NO plus two times RT natural log, etc. 
Now the bottom equations are going to be on the top of the next slide. And now we can simplify it. So we take the g terms and we put those in the first parentheses, and then we combine the natural log terms. And then if you notice that the first term in the middle equation is just equal to delta g of um, standard. And so that's products minus reactants. And then we can combine the second term and we see we have RT times a bracket natural log A and O2 minus etc. Now the bottom reaction the equation again is going to be on top of the next page. And now we can use the, the rules for net logs to actually simplify it. So we end up with delta G equals delta G naught plus RT natural log A and O2 squared over A and O squared times A O2. Now as you notice that this is actually products of reactants coefficients becoming um, exponents. And so that's actually where the expression for equivalent constants and the expression for um, reaction quotients come from. Product reactants, um, exponents, coefficients become exponents. Now you should notice that that fraction in the natural log is actually just equal to Q. And you should remember that at equilibrium, Q is equal to K and delta G is equal to zero. Again, remember that at equilibrium, the slope of the line is zero and delta G is equal to the slope of that line. And so we plug in delta G, plug in zero for delta G, plug in K for Q, we get zero is equal to delta G naught plus RT natural log Q, sorry, natural log K. And then if we subtract minus R, subtract RT natural log K for both sides, we get delta G naught equals RT natural log K. And so this is a very nice equation. It shows you that you can actually get K from delta G naught or delta G naught from K. Those two are related. Again, delta G naught and K are constants for a specific reaction at a specific temperature. Again, remember delta G and Q change as the reaction proceeds. And again, please remember Q and K, they have different meanings. Q changes as the reaction proceeds. K is a constant for a specific reaction at a specific temperature. It doesn't change. And so if Q and K um, are the same, that means the system is at equilibrium. Now if we look at a reaction, we have 2NO plus O2 going to 2NO2. And again, we can write down the equivalent expression properly would be in terms of activities. And so we have products of reactants, coefficients become exponents. So we have activity of NO2 squared divided by activity of NO squared times activity of O2. Now again, we can make the approximation or something of ideal gas. And so that gives you that activity is equal to partial pressure divided by one bar. And we can simplify this as long as we remember, as long as you promise to remember that even though we're writing that partial pressure of NO2 squared, we actually mean partial pressure of NO2 divided by one, one bar and that quantity squared. And so the bottom e um, equation is just the middle equation simplified. Again, the bottom one actually means the middle one. Activities are always unitless. Eclipse constants are always unitless. And so this is our thermodynamic K. Again, thermodynamically, we always treat gases using activities um, in terms of partial pressures if we're assuming ideal gases. Now, K sub C means we're writing things in terms of concentrations. Now, often you'll find in, in textbooks where they talk about K and K sub P, if they write the K in terms of pressure, they'll use K sub P. I don't think that's correct. I use K if I'm doing it properly in terms of activities. I use K sub C if I'm using concentrations. And so here we can write in terms of concentrations. And again, you can write just in terms of concentrations as long as you remember that when you write it in terms of concentrations, you actually mean the concentration is divided by one mole per liter, getting rid of those units. And so it's kind of interesting. We have two equilibrium constants, um, K and K sub C. Again, K is the thermodynamic K. K sub C is in terms of concentrations. And so the interesting question that we could ask is, do these two equilibrium constants have the same value? And in this case, actually, the answer is no. Now we can do a quick derivation to actually test this. And so we have our K. Now you should remember for an ideal gas, PV equals NRT. And so P equals NRT over V. And so we plug in NRT over V for the partial pressures. Now RT and V are all, sorry, RT are constants. And so they can come out, assuming that we're a constant temperature. And so now we have NV terms and RT terms and NV is just concentration, and we can combine our Rts. And so we end up with um, concentration NO2, NO2 squared over the concentration of NO squared and O2, and we have one over RT. Now you should recognize the concentration part as just your K sub C. 
And so what we've shown with this loaded derivation that k equals k sub c over rt for this case. Now in general, k equals k sub c rt delta n. So you don't always have to do that little, little derivation as long as you remember the equation k equals k sub c rt delta n. Now delta, delta n is the gas particle, number of gas particles products minus the number of gas particles reactants. And so for our reaction, we had two gas particles products. We had three gas particles reactants. Two minus three gives us a minus one. And so using that equation, we get k equals k sub c times rt to the minus one, which is what we found with our little derivation. Now, only when there's the same number of gas particles as products as reactants does k equal k sub c. And so if you have a different number of gas particles products and reactants, then k will not equal k sub c. I should also mention that k equals k sub c times rt delta n, you cannot, not, 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 not to get temperature dependence of that constants from this. It's just that the relationship between k and k sub c actually depends on temperature. And that's the only reason temperature's in that equation. If we look at another reaction, we have two HCl aqueous going to H2 gas plus Cl2 gas. And so thermodynamic K would be partial pressure of H2 times partial pressure of Cl2 divided by concentration of HCl squared. Now we could do K sub C and that would be everything in terms of concentration. So concentration of H2, concentration of Cl2 divided by H concentration of HCl squared. Now again, we remember the concentrations are all divided by moles per liter and partial pressure is all divided by bar, and so everything is unitless. And so the only difference between K and K sub C is how you handle the gas particles. But again, please remember pure solid pure liquids are not included in the expressions because they have activities of one. AQ means dissolved in water, aqueous. It's not a pure liquid, and so it is included in the equilibrium expression. But again, only difference between K and K sub C is how gases are treated. Um, K and K sub C treats aqueous the same way. K and K sub C, we treat solids and pure liquids the same way. Solids and pure liquids do not appear in K and K sub C. And so if we use our equation, K equals K sub C, RT delta N, we have two gas particles products, non reactants, and so two minus zero is two. And so we get K equals K sub C, RT squared. Now, if you're going to use K, you have to use Q. And so if you're going to define, do the thermodynamic K, you have to use the thermodynamic Q. If you're going to use K sub C, then you have to use Q sub C. And so if your K is just in concentrations, then your Q has to be just in terms of concentrations. Now in the equation delta G equals minus RT natural log K, that K is the thermodynamic K, it's the one in terms of activities, and it is not K sub C. Again, we showed that K and K sub C are not necessarily the same numerical value, and so you gotta make sure that you use the thermodynamic K and not the K sub C in this equation. Also, again, remember that taking the natural log of something has to be unitless, whatever you take the natural log of. We can look at different examples. So here we have silver chloride going to silver ions plus chloride ions. Again, if we write it properly, like a P chemist does, we do it in terms of activity. So activity of silver ions times activity of chloride ions divided by activity of silver chloride. Now again, pure solids, pure liquids do not appear. They have activities of one. And so on the bottom, you notice that they're gone. And again, we can write in terms of concentrations as long as we remember, as long as we promise to remember that it's concentration divided by one mole per liter so that it is unitless. And so notice in this case, K and K sub C are exactly the same. And so again, the only difference between K and K sub C is how you treat um, gases. Because we have no gases, K and K sub C are treated exactly the same. We can again use our equation, K equals K sub C RT delta N. Here we have delta N is zero minus zero, which is zero, and so K equals K sub C. We can look at a different reaction. Here we have sulfur plus O2 going to SO2 gas. And so pure solids, pure liquids have activities of one, so do not appear. And so the properly written equilibrium um, constant, K sub C, is concentration of SO2 divided by O2. Products over reactants, coefficients become exponents. Pure solids, pure liquids have activities of one, and so do not appear. Now if we take that reaction and we swap it, and so SO2 goes from being a product to a reactant, sulfur and O2 go from reactants to products. Notice what happens to the equilibrium expression. Now we have O2 over SO2. And so if you swap products and reactants, you have to take the inverse of the equilibrium constant. 
which makes more, which makes a lot of sense. And so for the top reaction, the products are a lot more stable, so it gives you a very large Eckham constant. The bottom one, the reactants are a lot more stable, it gives you much smaller Eckham constant. Remember, whatever is written on the right-hand side is defined as products. Whatever is on the left-hand side of the double arrows is defined as reactants. Now, if we take this reaction and we multiply it by 2, notice what happens to the Eckham expression. And so on the top reaction, we have K is equal to SO3 divided by O2 to the 3 halves. On the bottom, one we have SO3 squared divided by O2 cubed. And so the bottom one is just the top one squared. And so if you multiply the reaction by a number, now again, reactions are very similar to mathematical equations. You can multiply by numbers, you can swap. Um, we'll see, see that we can even add them. And so if you multiply a reaction by a number, you have to take the Eckham constant to that power to get the Eckham constant for the new reaction. And so if the top one has the Eckham constant 1.1 times 10 to the 62nd, the bottom one after we multiply it by a number is actually 1.2 times 10 to the 124th. If we multiply the top one times 4, we have to take the Eckham constant to the power of 4. And so the bottom one is, as written, the Eckham constant is 1.2 times 10 to the 248. And so if you swap products reactants, you have to take the inverse of the Eckham constant. If you multiply the reaction times number, you have to take the Eckham constant to that power. Now we can also add reactions. Again, reactions are a lot like mathematical equations. And so if we add reactions, sometimes we end up with things common on both sides. Those things actually cancel, and that gives us our net reaction. And so the top reaction, the Eckham constant is SO2 over O2. The bottom reaction, the second reaction, concentration, the Eckham constant is SO3 divided by SO2, O2 to a half. And if we multiply those together, we get SO3 divided by O2 to the three halves, which is the Eckham constant for the sum of those two reactions. And so if you add two reactions, you have to multiply the corresponding Eckham constants. And so again, swap product reactants, you take the inverse, you multiply the reaction times the number, you take the Eckham constant to that power, you add two reactions, you multiply those the Eckham constants according to two reactions to get the Eckham constant for the sum. Equilibrium is cool.